PPI Sports has always been a massive supporter of natural bodybuilding, so it only made sense for us and them to partner up. This episode of the podcast is brought to you by BPI Sports, and if you want to support them and us, use code NattyNewsDaily at checkout for some exclusive discounts off any of your orders. Enjoy the episode. What's going on, people? Welcome to another episode of Natty News Daily. We've got Mr. Valentin Tambosi on. Uh, Valentin, I, I was mentioned to him earlier, is someone I've been following for quite some time, very well known within the coaching industry. Uh, I'm very close friends with my coach, Cliff Wilson. I'm sure a lot of you watching know who he is, but maybe if you don't, uh, can you give us a brief intro, my man? Well, what's up, guys? Um, so my name is Valentin Tambosi. I'm a contest prep coach out of Vienna, Austria. I'm also a speaker at the Intelligent Strength Strength Coach Program here at Das Gym. Some of you may know this gym. So um, it's also based in Vienna. It's right over there. And I initially got into the industry through personal training. So that was almost seven years ago. And did the basic transformation fat loss thing and then slowly transitioned into online coaching where I basically met Cliff. So Cliff went from somebody who coached me to a mentor to one of my best friends. And the funny thing when we when people talk about Cliff is always we are doing all of this online and Cliff is such a dinosaur when it comes to online coaching. <laughs> so but true. he just <laughs> but but he just gets results. So it doesn't yeah. really matter. Yeah. And 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 that that is always something that makes me I just think it's really, really funny when it comes to coaching and being sort of like mentored by somebody on yeah. in the online realm who is basically just using email and gets results. So yeah. um I just wanted to mention that because I always think that's a nice nice intro when it comes to Cliff and also my association with him. Yeah, I can echo that statement because that's conversations we've had, um, you know, through email and stuff is, is how, yeah, how the hell is business is so successful. But I mean, at the end of the day, it, it was built prior to social media. So, right. you know, and he still gets results, right. And a lot of his clientele are very top level athletes and whether he sends them an Instagram message or a WhatsApp message or an email, they're going to get results regardless. And, you know, his formula works. It's just hilarious that he'll post like once a month on Instagram <laughs> and right, his, right. Coach, his coaching is like top notch. Right. So, um, yeah. but yeah. Okay. Let's get into the meat and potatoes of what we're going to talk about, um, which is, you know, basically training and, you know, Valentin's very, uh, outspoken on social media with regards to training and the content he's putting out it's really really good stuff so you guys aren't following him please do so because you're going to learn a ton um but first off man i want to touch on with regards to training for natural athletes specifically and you know optimizing their training getting the most out of their training and you know let's get past the beginner stages like let's speak to you know competitors that have been in the game now maybe you know two or three seasons under their belt they're trying to get from that you know, advanced to intermediate stages, what, what do they need to start focusing on? Number one, don't make the mistake of thinking that you have to move away from the basics. I think this is something that is extremely common where people think, okay, I've competed once or maybe twice now. Now it's about to become really advanced. And that's really not what it's all about. Because if you've already competed successfully once or twice, all you have to do is continue to do what you've been doing. Um, if you take a look at the best of the best in natural bodybuilding or probably in every sport, they just did the same thing for a longer period of time, right? <laughs> and especially in a sport like this, it's like, okay, if you've nailed the basics, which most of us haven't done in the first two years, we always do some crappy stuff. For sure. But once you've nailed the basics and know what you have to do, you just do that for two decades. That's it. Yeah, then you basically finish the game and you can move on. Right? <laughs> so when, whenever, I, whenever clients ask me questions or whenever I see discussions online, I'm always holding back a little bit because I don't want to make it seem like I'm not passionate about this at all. I'm very passionate about this. This is all I do. But I always have to hold myself back when it comes to, to these discussions and, and these certain topics in terms of tr nutrition and training when people try to make this so complicated yeah. and move away from the stuff that has given them results already. So basically they accumulate results, they get better and better. And then all of a sudden they just stop doing those things. And the question is, why did you stop? Um, just because the tempo like got reduced a little bit, the tempo of progression got reduced a little bit. That's just genetics. That's just the name of the game, right? Yeah. So all you have to do is figure out what works, figure out what people who have already achieved what you want have done in the past. And then basically copy that. Um, you can actually apply this to many, many areas of life. Um, the problem with most of us 
and this applies to me uh, as well in the past, you always think you're special and you need a special solution for your problems. Right. Um, thousands or millions of people have already had the problems you had and they solved them successfully. So simply do what they have done to solve that and move forward with your life. Yeah. Yeah. So you think it, more of an incremental changes approach is, is more appropriate than, you know, just throwing out the baby with the bathwater. hundred percent, because this is, this is what you see when you talk about nuance and also when you have different discussions regarding training programs or different training approaches, people go from one extreme to the next. And this is like, whether it's high volume versus high intensity, right? That, that would be a classic example. Yeah. Um, people try one thing, but they don't try it for long enough. And they <laughs> don't really look at, okay, what made this work for other people. And like two weeks into the training program or this training approach, they just go the exact opposite direction. Yeah. So and then go, they're like, well, this doesn't work. So they'll go from a, 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 a program that, that, you know, had programs two sets of a movement to a program that move that, that programs like seven sets. And it's like, why not try go from two, see what going to three does and then, and then make, you know, Exactly. Like this happens so many times during the check-in process when I'm like, when I'm telling a client, okay, I'm going to adjust your volume slightly for this exercise or for this muscle group. Mm -hmm. And then they take a look into the training program. They're like, okay, it's one extra set for this exercise and one extra set for this exercise. I'm like, yeah, exactly. It's two total for the entire week. Uh, they're really disappointed because they, they thought, okay, now we're going to hammer this weakness with crazy volume and we're going to do this and that and this and that. And we're just basically adding two sets and that's pretty much it. The same thing applies to anything like stress management or supplements. Like um, you make small changes and then see what happened. You do the same thing in a dieting process or contest prep process. Nobody's cutting half your carbs in a single week. Like that would be stupid. Why do you take the same approach uh, or the same logic and apply it to training volume? It just doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah. And you see that, you know, just observing online as the younger demographic seeking out all these variety and changes, right? Like I follow guys that have been competing for years and years and you know someone that comes to mind is levi burge who posts the basic hard heavy stuff and he's posted it for years and years and years right and i mean he's he's one of the best in the game you know doug miller brian whitaker like a lot of their training revolves around the basics right what worked and and there are guys that have been doing it like you mentioned earlier for north of two decades right so it, it's hard not to see what clearly is doing something right yeah, Levi is a perfect example. I just like before this podcast, I actually checked out his profile because it's always so funny. He's simply posting Bible verses with his training. Yeah. And that's all he does. And it's just like it, it's 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 so simple and basic. And he's been doing that for I think 17 years or something like that, maybe yeah. even longer. Yeah. Um, the way he looks is because of that, not because of anything fancy or something that hasn't been around for a long period of time. Uh, so whenever people suggest something that is new or something that is, quote unquote, more optimal, I always ask them, okay, can you back that up with something? It doesn't have to be the most amazing results over like a dozen people, but can you back that up with results on yourself? Right? Whether that's cuffed laterals versus dumbbell laterals versus anything else, right? Um, can you back it up with something? Give me something. Just saying this is more optimal and then explaining anatomy or biomechanics is fine, but the end goal has to be that we get something better out yeah. of that. And that There's is usually not the case. Exactly, right? If somebody tells me, okay, um, sleep one hour extra, that is more optimal. That is probably true, but am I going to look significantly better on stage if I do that? Maybe, maybe not. But if we don't know exactly, then I'm not sure if I want to just give that a shot just because you think it's more optimal. Right, right. Yeah, that's a good way of putting it. Um, so is there, is there little things then that you've kind of, you know, you mentioned the cuff lateral. Like, is there any, you know, two or three little things off the top of your head that you've witnessed or experienced with clients that you're like, yeah, okay, that, that maybe is useful long, if you commit to that long-term, like outside of the basics, like a cuff lateral, like a, you know, certain pull down movement, you know what I mean? Like all the, the kind of the hip stuff right now. Um, well, one thing I definitely want to mention here is 
the way you think about certain things. So for example, let's take a look at rep ranges, right? I'm currently doing a high rep experiment where I'm trying yes. very, very high rep stuff, which I do not recommend to most people. <laughs> but how how reason, high are you going? Like 25, 30? Uh, 50. 50. Oh, damn. Yeah. So <laughs> that, the, one, the, one day, uh, the one day you posted the hack squat, I think it was a 30 repper. And I had, yeah. le- I had legs the next day and I, and I woke up feeling like a million bucks and I happened to see that post and yeah, 30 reps on the hack. I, I got 20 and then it was like a fiver and then it was singles and oh my. Yeah. Oh my. Yeah. The, the thing is, um, and I made a post about that, um, rep ranges and how you think about those rep ranges is going yep. to hugely affect how you train. So um, what we did last time with the hack squat, we bumped up the weight significantly and aimed for 20 reps. And what happened is I got to 20 reps and I was like, this is much easier than starting to set out thinking about 30 reps, right? So a joke I made to my training partner is when you do 30 reps, the set gets hard at 12 reps. When you do 20 reps, the set gets hard at 17 reps because you constantly think about 30 reps, right? It's not so much that it's heavier, obviously it's lighter, but it's so much more difficult because you have to accumulate so many reps. So um, the, the bottom point when, that I want to make with this is you have to be motivated by your rep ranges, right? And the motivation doesn't have to be, okay, I feel good doing this. There's going to be a lot of discomfort, but you have to be kind of like excited to work hard in that rep range. Yep. And 30 is probably the upper limit for most people. Like I'm not going to do 40, 50 rep sets for most people. Um, so the usual recommendations we have with rep ranges five to 20 reps, something like that is probably a good mark for most people, right? But then you can move within those rep ranges and ask people, hey, do you feel more comfortable with, uh, with reps two, like sets two 10 reps or plus 10 reps? And then you can apply those rep ranges individually, depending on where the client likes to work the hardest. And that is most likely going to give you better quality sets and also more failure points across the training session because the person is just excited to train in that rep range. So that is going to be, that is definitely a huge one that I've come up with in the last two years, probably. That's interesting. And I can, uh, I can speak to that with my own training with regards to like a deadlift, for example, I can get amped for a three to six deadlift, like pure enjoyment out of it. But if you're asking me to do, I mean, even North of 10 reps on like a, on some kind of like hip hinge, it just like, eh, I'd rather do like a lunge or a leg press or, or a different kind of posterior focus movement, but just a heavy set of deadlifts. Like I just get excited for it. Right. And you know, it's something that you can then, you know, progress for the next two decades. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so the limiting factor that comes with higher reps for different exercises yep. is not always going to be your muscles. Actually in the rarest case, it's the muscle that is stopping you from going all the way to failure. It's other things. Um, whether it's neural inhibition, whether it's just your mind, whether it's cardiovascular fitness, like let's say you do some crazy stuff like Doug Miller does on the deadlifts. I don't think people realize how incredible the stuff he like that he does on the deadlift. Um, if you ever try to do like 180, 180 kg for 20 reps on a deadlift, that is so hard on your lungs and everything else. Um, it's not like the back is not the problem. It's something else, right? And that's the thing when you can take rep ranges and make sure I take a rep range that is most likely going to make the muscle fail and not something else, then you're probably on a good path along with exercise selection and making sure that everybody stays safe. Yep. Yep. No, that's, uh, that's great. And, and have you noticed any variance in progress? Um, from like a hypertrophy standpoint for certain rep ranges, like for muscle group, like there's kind of a, you know, a wide, I guess, suggestion that quads, for example, respond to maybe a bit higher rep range versus other muscle groups. Now, have you noticed that yourself at all with, with quads or with calves or, you know, side delts, anything like that? Definitely with something like delts, it's just, it's just very easy to increase overall training density and training volume when you do high, high rep laterals, right? Yep. But something else like as soon as you move into compound exercises, for example, even upper body high rep pressing is very problematic. Um, there's so many things that speak against finishing that set with your chest, 
for example, uh, yeah, like your triceps gives out, your shoulder gives out, it, it feels unstable, stuff like that. So you probably are not going to be able to say, okay, this applies to the entire upper body or to this muscle group. It's very specific to exercise selection, right? So for example, a 45 degree leg press on high reps is, is, is crushing you, but at the same time, a seated leg press for high reps, it kind of works much, much better because the weight is not pressing down on you, right? right? right. Um, so it really comes down to exercise selection more so than muscle groups, I would say. Okay. I think, I think it might be a little bit variable from individual to individual because um, I know for me, um, a lot of my pressing, I actually, I I do well in the lower rep ranges, but I, I do pretty well, actually, I, I even up to like 20 reps on, on a press, but like vertical pulling, it's like, once I get past like 12, it's like, mm, uh, it, it, I do, I actually do better in like, I, I do really well in like the five to seven actually like with vertical pulling, but it, it just depends though. But, but um, this is information you can take. If a client communicates that you just yeah. take that information and you put that into the pre training program like that. Um, mm -hmm. like he's going to enjoy that so much and he's going to take a look at the training program and he's like, Oh my God, you read my mind because I now perform these rep ranges for these specific movements and muscle groups. And this is exactly how I want to train. So the euphoria and motivation you get from that for the training program is going to be absolutely exceptional. And it's going to be so much more worthwhile listening to your clients and applying those things because they feel understood and then they will train so much harder. Yeah. And then using themselves as a, as an N equals one experiment, I think is possibly one of the most important things in general. Yeah. In your I agree. training career. I agree. I mean, there's, there's some generalization you can make, but in the end, like in the end, like the, we are mostly the same when it comes to genetics, right? Uh, we are 99 point something the same, but those little adjustments you make, and this goes back to what we spoke about earlier, they are going to be little adjustments. So that one person may need a different volume, but a different volume doesn't mean double the sets. It means maybe one or two sets more, and that's it. So the variability between individuals is so much smaller than what most people think. Yep, yep. And, that's, and that kind of comes back to what we've spoke about earlier with people trying to like overcomplicate it and, and completely overhaul things where you know, you're adding two sets and that could be just enough to start really kickstarting progress, right? Whereas if you bury yourself doubling your sets, well, well yeah, you're going to start regressing at that point. Yeah, I think the, and I, I did a video on this earlier, when it comes to coaching, it's so much more about managing a person than managing training and nutrition. Like the things you have to know about anatomy, biomechanics, stress management, supplementation, all those things, you can learn that, right? But once you know that, you apply it to the client and you're more so managing the person. Uh, so the way you read between the lines, the way you read the person, the way you respond to the person, this is what Cliff is so good in an email format. Like this is, this is exceptional. Other people have to have voice notes and video check-ins. He just reads between the lines and he knows what you're doing, what you're thinking, what you're worrying about reading an email, right? That's what makes good coaches, good coaches. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's a hundred percent. I can, again, I can attest to that just working directly with them. Uh, yeah, let's, yeah. let's transition a little bit to the technique versus load argument. So most recently, um, AJ Morris, again, most of you following and, and watching right now know who AJ is, um, posted a video of a barbell row and, you know, that, that's an exercise that gets a lot of heat, right? Whereas you got the one camp that says, you know, completely parallel with the ground, you know, full pause at the bottom, you know, contraction at the top, much lighter load than if you did it in the way AJ did it, where he's a little bit more upright, um, you know, got a little bit more movement at the torso. Um, but in the video hitting three plates for 10 reps. And, you know, I think one of his main talking points in his post was like, this is how I like to barbell row. This is what's effective for me. So you chimed in on that, you know, something along the lines of people going to comment with smaller backs that that is incorrect. So I, I said something very similar. Where, where do you lie in the camp of the whole technique versus load versus, you know, making sure everything is, is by the books on point versus, you know, you know, what I'm trying to say. Yeah. So, well, first of all, the people that commented on my comment that AJ pinned on that post, 
they basically were proving my point when I looked at their profile. So I just want to get that out of the way because this, this it's always the same when the when when we have this discussion about technique versus load. Um, I don't think it's technique versus load. It's more like how do you understand biomechanics and especially inertia. So I recently made a post about about people using very little weight and and moving that weight in an extremely controlled manner. Right. I've seen many, many examples of that. I've seen time under tension based training where people look for how long is that tension on the muscle with very light, very easy weight yeah. with picture perfect technique. And those people, yeah, they look, they look the way they look. So um, <laughs> what, what the post comes down to is those people that try to have a perfectly parallel back to the ground during a barber row. They're basically trying to javelin throw a handkerchief, right? You need a certain amount of load to elicit a stimulus. And especially when you have good technique for a barber row, which is very unstable by definition, right? Stability is going to be the limiting factor in all cases for any row. So if you're only looking at stability and making sure stability is guaranteed, you're never going to have any appreciable amount of weight on the bar. So therefore, technique for a barber row has to move in a direction where we think about safety. And AJ performed the barber row that was not parallel to the ground, but he was safe enough to not get injured, right? And that's the point. It's safe enough to not get injured and hit the target musculature. And another point that I want to make when it comes to this whole discussion is people try to isolate muscle groups, especially in the back, with a compound exercise. You cannot do that. So... And also making comparisons between different muscle groups when the back is consisting of different fiber alignments, different muscle groups, the lower back, all of those things. It's much more complex than just doing a barber row and then one muscle group on your back grows. Yeah. Uh, many, many things do work when you perform a heavy barber row. Uh, and obviously, and I know this argument is not very, uh, very sophisticated, but every time I look at somebody who is is doing heavy barbell rows, not with their back parallel to the ground. They have a bigger back than me. And I'm like, okay, did they get injured? No. Then that's basically the only potential downfall that comes with this technique. If they never gotten injured and they got the result they wanted, which is a bigger back, then they win. Yep. Well, what's it matter then at that point, right? Right. I mean, if, if you do it so you... Um, so you can say, okay, my barber row looks super perfect, clean like that with this technique. That's fine. But understand that that's not going to get you any better results than somebody who is doing it with a different technique, right? And technique is a very, it's a very problematic word. Um, because as long as the outcome is what you desire, then the technique is appropriate. Yep. Yep. I can, uh, when it comes to my chest, for example, my chest has always been a strong point. And for a long time, I did flat bench press forever. And mm -hmm. that's a movement that gets a, it, a ton of heat. People say that it's, you know, not very effective for your chest. You're just asking for injury and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, I've, I've had the odd tweak here and there, but who hasn't? But as, as a general over my training career, it's something I can get really strong at and my chest responds to. So who am I to argue that a bench press is a bad movement, right? Yeah. I mean, I mean, if you just take it single cases, there's always going to be somebody that had a problem with this or that exercise. Yeah. Right. Um, and I don't know why this has happened with rowing and barbell rowing in particular, but I think it's because you actually loading the spine, there's potential injury in your lower back, like stuff like that. It's the same with deadlift, right? Yeah. Um, but especially with rows, because there's some kind of shoulder extension and elbow flexion, people are like, okay, this is the movement to judge somebody's training quality by. And I, I just think that is um, a little funny, yeah. Yeah, and I think too, at the end of the day, when you take someone like AJ posting that, like his training experience, you know, he's been doing this a long time. So he clearly knows what he's doing from a movement standpoint and what's going to get him, you know, potential results without risking injury and stuff like that. And maybe you have someone that's been training for six months and is like, Oh, that's going to get you hurt. And uh, you know, right. you got to audit what that, that comment is coming from. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Is there uh, is there a look difference that you see? Uh, this is something I've asked Cliff. I basically just said, you know, the guys that lift hard and heavy, you know, 
the barbell rows, the squat, the deadlift, you know, the guys that are doing the big basic stuff. Have you observed a difference in their look um, on stage? And, and, you know, Cliff basically said, yes. He's like, I, I can't give you a definitive answer as to why, you know, I've been coaching for 10, 15, 20 years now. And I've observed there is a difference. Do you feel that way too? I do, but I think we have to be very careful how we word this. So the reason we see somebody have this hard and dense look on stage, especially around their posterior chain, when they turn around on stage, is because they simply have more muscle there. And the question we have to ask, how did they get the muscle there? And secondly, how did they keep it in a calorie deficit? So I don't think it's necessarily just because of heavy barbell rows, heavy deadlifts, stuff like that. Yes, that is obviously the base, but it's also how those people train in a calorie deficit and how they can maintain performance. I think this is hugely overlooked because people just look at, okay, he's doing barbell rows in the off season. And now seven months later, <laughs> after a long prep, his back looks like that. Well, we have to ask ourselves what happened in those seven months between his heaviest off season barber row and stepping on stage, right? Did he continue to roll like that? Or did he change something? Did he right. maintain his performance? Like all of these questions have to be asked before we simply conclude this 170 kilogram barber row produces a back like that. Yep. It helps producing a back like that, but it's not the only reason. Very well said. Very well said. Let's uh, quickly touch on then training throughout prep um, and the importance you put on that then. Yeah. So I, I think this is, this is one of the key factors. I see that all the time with first timers that I coach. Um, I see that training like after 12 weeks into prep and I'm like looking at the videos and I'm like, we are, we are losing muscle if we continue to train like that. I don't think a lot of people realize how much, of, how much muscle loss you're going to cause if you're not continuing to push your performance. Yeah. Uh, obviously, protein intake matters, your stress management matters, your sleep, and so on and so forth. But mostly your training performance is going to protect your muscle mass. So all the people that look super impressive on stage that have that hard dance look, you need pressure against the skin to achieve that. And that comes from making sure you hold all your muscle. So as a natural athlete, you cannot, you cannot expect to gain any muscle, especially not deep into prep. So you're going to maintain it and lose a little bit towards the end of a long prep. And if that's the case, that's fine. But you have to make sure it's just a little bit. Uh, during my last contest prep in 2017, Cliff and I extended my prep to do a show, to do another show in Chicago. And that was a very bad decision because I lost so much muscle in that time period because I just, what it was like, if uh, like a, a switch was flipped and I just couldn't get myself to train as hard because the prep length was just too much. Right. Well, the, so, what was the time period change? Um, so we decided to do a show mid August at the end of May. And I was already in prep since November. Oh shit. Yeah. That's yeah. You know, that, that's a conversation that I've had with the guys on the podcast about like my prep, you know, I can basically cram in, you know, three or four shows over like a six week period. And I'm like, yeah, I'm a hundred percent doing that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like get in, get out. Right. Yeah. Do you and that's exactly. Shows? Yeah. A hundred percent. So yeah. Yeah. Thank, thank like you for confirming yeah. that thought. <laughs> that, that, that was a huge mistake. And it, the reason was not just the length of the deficit. It was the fact that my training performance just no stive because because of that so as as soon as you cannot protect performance anymore you're going to run into issues it's not like okay i wasn't able to match my numbers for two weeks now now i'm losing all my muscles that's not what ha is going to happen but it if happens consistently over many many weeks you're going to look worse and worse and worse so you have to understand how to protect that and make sure you set up your your show schedule according to that right? Yeah. If your first show is at the beginning of September, for example, and your last show at the end of November, can you really get to that last show looking better than for your first show? So what I always try to set up my clients up for is we want to be like 90% for the first show, 95 for the second, 100% yeah. for the last show. There's no point in being 100% for the first show and the 95 for the second and 90% for the last one, right? The yeah. last one is the big one in most cases. Yeah, that's yeah. exactly that's exactly the route we're taking. My big um, show with the WMBF is April 23rd. Um, I'm going to be on stage last weekend in March, first weekend in April. So then we've got show, show, show. And that's that's exactly what we're going to do is, you know, 85, 90, 
95 and then let's get that hundred percent. And, and, you know, we have basically three weeks to go from that 85, 90 to a hundred, which I think is going to time out perfectly. Yeah. And, and this is very hard to get into people's heads because they're like, I don't want to step on stage unless I'm a hundred percent for all shows. And you have to get rid of that thought because it's not going to happen. Yeah. Once you're a hundred percent, you cannot maintain that for very long. You may can maintain that for back-to-back shows on back-to-back weekends. But yeah. if we say, okay, we're going to be 100% at the beginning of September and at the end of November, no freaking way. Um, so you have, to, you have to sort of like account for that time period and make sure your season length is appropriate to how long you can maintain training performance. It's closely linked together. Very, very smart. Yep. Um, before we close this out, can you maybe touch on a few things to aid in maintaining training performance, um, whether it's nutrition based, psychological, um, you know, for myself, I've been very, the last little while auto regulating intensity, like as far as like set count goes. Um, so if I'm going in there and I feel really good, I'll do kind of my normal volume, but you know, a week or two ago, I, I it wasn't there. So I, instead of two sets of hack, I did one, just really good one to failure. Same with deadlifts. If I'm not yeah. feeling it today, I'll do my one good set. And I'll make up some extra volume on isolation work. So maybe speak to that really quick before we go. Yeah. So in terms of nutrition, I would definitely aim if you have carbohydrates <laughs> at your disposal <laughs> and make sure you have them around your training session. So um, prioritize carbohydrate intake around your training session, whether that's uh, pre, intra and post, make sure there's some sort of like carbohydrate source in there. It's going to help massively, not just from a performance standpoint, but also psychologically, just yeah. the taste of something sweet in your mouth is going to affect a few things in your body. And in terms of training, uh, you touched on a very important point. You don't wanna, you don't wanna hold on to a certain set number. If you know I can absolutely destroy one set and push my performance that way, I'm going to do that one set and make sure I milk that set as long as possible yep. um, before trying. Like this is what I did in 2017. So don't do that. Um, increase sets but reduce intensity. You're just going to get weaker and more tired because of the added yeah. volume. Yeah. So if you say, okay, I can no longer maintain my performance for two sets. I'm just going to do four sets with reduced weight. You're getting less performance and you're going to get more and more tired over time because you're cu accumulating more fatigue through those extra sets. Um, every time, like when I cut volume for clients in prep, which we have to do because resources are getting less and less. Um, they always like, okay, I'm going to lose muscle from this. And I'm like, no, as long as you protect performance with the few sets you still have. So this is going to be the biggest thing. And in terms of stress management and recovery, I would include naps, like not because sleep in general is going to be hit or miss for most people when it comes to contest prep. Some people are unfazed. Other people cannot sleep at all. So as long as you get... I, yeah, I, am, I am the second camp. <laughs> yeah, same, same for me. I, like you, you wake up in the middle of the night and you're just wide awake for yeah, three hours. You're, you're just like, fun, just laying there thinking about nothing. Exactly. But at the same time, in the middle of the day, you might get sleepy and then you set your timer for 20, 30 minutes and you take a little nap. If you can do that, if your lifestyle allows that, I would definitely do that because you're getting in total more sleep that way uh, compared to just being wide awake at night. Yeah. Yeah. I find too, those naps, like you can get that, like that deep shut it down for 30 minutes. Like you feel like a million bucks after, like I would take a 30 minute yeah. power nap over like a three hour, you know, broken shitty sleep. <laughs> yeah. I agree. hundred percent, man. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you, man, for coming on the podcast. I think this was, I learned a ton. I think a lot of people are going to get a lot of value out of this. So um, we, we appreciate you coming on. Thanks guys for having me. Awesome. For thank those who want to get, for those who want to get in touch, social media coaching, where do they find you? Um, mostly on, on Instagram, just my name all the way through, no underscores, anything, Valentin Tambosi. That's where you find me. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you again. And, uh, if you guys like this episode, if you want to get Valentin back on, let us know. And, uh, you know, we can dive into maybe nutrition or, or some other areas of, uh, bodybuilding that we can talk about. Um, let us know and we'll, we'll set it up. So thanks again, guys. If you enjoyed the episode, give it a like, subscribe to the channel for future episodes, and we'll see you guys in the next one.